So good afternoon, everyone. And I want to start with a happy new year as we enter a new year. Uh, my name is Vince Bonham. I'm the acting deputy director at the National Human Genome Research Institute. And I'm pleased to introduce our lecture series. So I want to welcome you to the 30th lecture of the NIH Genomics and Health Disparities Lecture Series, which began in May of 2015. The series aims to highlight the opportunities of genomics research to address health disparities and advance health equity. Uh, the series is co-sponsored by uh, four additional institutes at NIH, uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestives, and Kidney Disease, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, along with the National Human Genome Research Institute. We're also pleased that our collaborator and co-sponsor is the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity at the Food, Food and Drug Administration. Speakers have been chosen by the institutes involved uh, in the sponsorship of this uh, program, as well as um, making sure that they are bringing a conversation about issues around health disparities and health equities reflected on genetics and genomics. The speakers series approaches this problem and areas of issues from different perspectives of basic science, population genomics, translational clinical and social science research, and policy issues of importance to health equity, uh, health disparities, and genetics and genomics. Uh, we are pleased to have Dr. Genevieve Wolchik joining us this afternoon, and my colleague, Dr. Jamil Scott, the Senior Scientific Program Analyst uh, at NHGRI, will introduce uh, Genevieve. Good afternoon. Dr. Genevieve Woshek is a genetic epidemiologist and assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her research focuses on understanding the role of ancestry in genetic risk and developing solutions to address health inequities for diverse and admixed populations as well as genetic susceptibility to infectious disease. Her most recent work explores the interaction of genetic ancestry and the environment in admix populations and downstream consequences for genetic risk prediction. Dr. Wojcik is a member of multiple NIH consortia, including the population architecture using genetic and ge genetic epidemiology study, the clinical genome resource, and the Polygenic Risk Methods in Diverse Populations Consortium. Following Dr. Wolschitz's talk, Mr. Bonham will facilitate the discussion. Virtual attendees, please submit your questions at any time to the Q&A box. Those in person, please do approach the microphones. There are two in this room after the lecture. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wolschitz. All right. Hi, everyone in the room and to everybody online. Um, first, I want to thank the um, NIH for inviting me to speak with you today. And I'm just going to go right in because I, I worry I'm going to go over a little bit. And so uh, my research program is, is based on this sort of fundamental disconnect we have in terms of our research, in which we know that in the United States, there's sort of a disproportionate burden of chronic disease on minoritized groups. And yet the majority of our genetic work is done within groups of European ancestry and European descent. So, you know, where the burden is lying, not say where we're focusing a large amount of our work. And so when I think about how to address this gap, um, where we need to look, I'm an epidemiologist from training. So I always refer back to these sort of DAGs and conceptual frameworks. Um, and really it's about how we model the systems. You know, we've had a large push for big data over the last you know, decade or two, and that's been very fruitful. Now that we have the data, how can we refocus and ask questions to better see what's going on? And so, you know, to sort of look at this, what we're going to do throughout this uh, talk is sort of walk through this framework using evidence from my own work and my group's work, as well as um, work from colleagues and the field at large. And so when we ask these questions, you know, in genetics, we really just think about the relationship between the genetics and the trait, a sort of very clear cut relationship we're thinking about. If this, then that. But What's actually happening is something way more complex. You have population genetics affecting the distribution of the actual genetics you're measuring. 
You have racial and ethnic identity in the mix as well with the socio-political context of that. You have other individual risk factors from lifestyle to biomarkers, um, as well as more macro scale social and structural determinants of health. So there's a lot going on. And when we're looking for this association between genetics and an outcome, it's important for us to think about, you know, amongst who are we looking at? Um, and if we're looking at relative risk, relative to who, right? So that's sort of interesting to think about for a population perspective. And so when it comes to the data that we're looking at, uh, we can take a look at what we see. And what I'm showing you here is um, from the GWAS catalog, published genome-wide association studies. These are large-scale genetic studies looking at the, the association between individual markers and a trait. And what I'm showing you here is the mean sample size. I think many people are used to seeing the total number of participants over time, which have increased. But I think it's also worthwhile to look at the mean sample size because that's really a rate-limiting step when it comes to discovery, right? How much statistical power do you have? And what you're seeing over here is sort of the annual um, mean sample size in the dashed lines, and then the cumulative knowledge base in the solid lines. And what you're seeing is that over the past, no, at this point, six years, five, six years, there's been this sort of meteoric rise in the mean sample size with much, much larger studies being published. This is largely driven by the UK Biobank and these sort of large scale biobanks. Um, and you can see they're colored here by how the GWAS catalog categorizes these participants. And so you see this big jump in the European populations, but if you zoom in on everybody else, it's relatively stagnant. So even if the total number of participants are increasing, the sample size, so how much statistical power you have per study, is relatively the same, right? So we're not get, sort of doing as well as we could be in this space. So it's important to think about not only the total number of participants, but per study and per question, what is your power like in terms of this big data? Now, when I try to think about, you know, how do we get here? You know, how do we, it's important when you get to a point, sort of understand the systems in place for how you did it. And if I try to peel back layer after layer after layer, it's turtles all the way down. And by that, what I mean is that there's sort of this bias baked into the system per, that permeates every single step. Now, over the past few years, a lot of this has sort of um, been improved upon, but really, if you look at just what we see with these genomic health inequities, and you go back one step to translation, who you choose to validate these things in our follow-up is often in these large-scale biobanks that are majority white or European ancestries. Uh, if you go further than that, a lot of the discovery methods that we use are out of the box made for a single homogenous population and therefore not made to um, account for the large number of diversity, the large level of diversity in our populations. Again, this is changing somewhat in the last several years with these methods becoming more standard to incorporate uh, diversity. And then if you think about even just who and how populations are sampled, right? So historically, even the genotype arrays were mainly from one population at a time and mostly European ancestries. Um, and then who we include in our studies, you know, these consortia are not very diverse. And again, these are changing, but it's a reactionary process to this inequity that exists. Um, and it all boils down to sort of what we accept as the default with our research. What do we accept as the default? Because it seems like for a lot of things we accept a relatively homogenous white population as the default, and then we try to catch up with everybody else later on. And so this sort of imbalance when it comes to genome-wide association studies also um, is exacerbated in polygenic scores. What I'm showing you here is polygenic scores that were published. So polygenic scores are a risk measurement where you're summing genetic risk across the entire genome. Um, and the PGS catalog uh, curates these. And what you're seeing on the first panel on the left-hand side is of all the published polygenic scores, what proportion of them include just those that have categorized as European or European ancestries? You can see most of them are those solid blue boxes. And there's some that maybe have mostly European, but maybe include other people, which is the plus signs there. And in the middle, what I'm showing you are populations that I focus on in my work, where these are all the published PGS that include anybody who is identified as African-American, Afro-Caribbean, um, or Hispanic or Latino, right? And that is definitely not reflective of global demographics, and it's definitely not reflective of the U.S. demographics, which you see on the last panel on the right-hand side. So you have these inequities and these disparities um, in your GWAS, and since polygenic scores are often built upon uh, GWAS summary statistics, it's even more exacerbated moving downstream from that. So we have these sort of lack of representation when it comes to global diversity um, of our genetic scores. So why do we care about diversity? You know, I think there's a lot of reasons why we care about diversity, uh, but from a method standpoint, it's partially because we know through many studies, um, including the work of Alicia Martin and the work I'm showing you here with um, Odom Senyuk looking at how 
badly, basically polygenic scores do in other populations. So here what they did is they trained polygenic scores in the UK Biobank, the white British sample, and then applied it to their Biobank in LA. And what you see in these different groups, how they categorized it, that there's each dot is a person and how well that risk score did in that person and individual level accuracy. And what's important to know is that there is a large amount of heterogeneity, both between these groups as expected, but also within these groups, right? And so you see overlap in terms of the distributions. Um, and so it's important to note that yes, there are differences between these groups, but also when you're discretizing the group membership and looking at the accuracy, there's also a large amount of heterogeneity within them, right? So it's important to have broad representation, not only between the categories, but within the categories as well to have that in your model. Okay. so. Um, I'm going to walk us through an example here. Uh, and so we know that PRS performed differently by racial ethnic groups is largely how we've been, been framing it here. Um, so we want to know for this research question, how is this further complicated by recent admixture uh, when you have a lot of heterogeneity within a single group, right? And then further, how is that complicated by heterogeneity and the environmental influences for these different outcomes, right? So what happens with even within a group you have a large amount of heterogeneity on both the genetic side and the environment side. And how does that influence how we would model genetic risk? So um, again, I'm an epidemiologist from training. So I think about population definitions. And I think it's important to note that when we think about this, these pathways for polygenic scores, you know, often we think about, okay, we only really care about the PRS to the outcome. And a lot of the method development that's been um, conducted tries to break up this relationship of what else going on by sort of severing this relationship between the population genetics in terms of the allele frequencies and the linkage equilibrium uh, to the polygenic score, right? But there's also other relationships at play here that might introduce other mediators or confounders that can be important for how we're looking at genetic risk. And so the, remember the goal for a polygenic risk score and for relative risk is that you want um, assumptions of exchangeability to be met, which means that you want to find the counterfactual, which essentially it says, if I want to compare an individual to a reference population, I want them to be comparable in everything except for the measure I'm looking at, which is the risk score, right? And so it's important to us to know, you know, is the reference that, that we're using actually comparable or are we introducing some unknown factors into that comparison? All right, so we're gonna build out the DAG here in terms of what's going on. Um, and looking at, we're gonna use BMI as an example. Now, BMI is not really a health-related trait in terms of being informative. It's not really clinically relevant at all in terms of the genetic space of things, uh, but it does provide us a really good example to work through this in a larger sample size of a trait that is both influenced by genetics as well as environment and differently between groups, as you'll see. So again, this is not meant to be clinically relevant in terms of the story, but rather to illustrate what could happen um, with a very commonly measured outcome. So the first relationship we're going to look at is we're going to look at just within Hispanic Latino individuals, right? We're going to focus on one group that is often assumed in the genetic space to be homogenous, is often assumed to be sort of all the same in the level that's sort of applied to other groups. And we're going to sort of see how that's true or not. And so we're looking at, again, the relationship between ancestry and SIPs and then the group membership further beneath within this group, a substructure um, and ancestry itself. So for this, um, I work a lot in the PAGE study. Uh, this is a long-running NHGRI study um, that focused on minoritized groups, started in 2008 and has been ongoing since then. And this is from PAGE 2, which ran about 2013 to 2018. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a principal components analysis. So what you're looking at is every dot on the left-hand side here is a person, and they are colored by how they self-identify, right? There's no reclustering existing. And to orient you, uh, to the right-hand side, you have this sort of African uh, inferred ancestry component being pulled out here. On the top, it's East Asian. Um, to the left and back are the Indigenous of the Americas uh, component being pulled out. And at the bottom, it's Europe. And so what you can see sort of off the bat from this is that there is no real way for you to cluster these individuals into these discrete groups that's meaningful for genetics. There's no clear cut point that I can say anybody at this side of this cut point is this group, anybody at that side is a different group, um, because it's sort of this continuous distribution. Now, what I'm showing you on the right hand side here is looking beyond PC1 and PC2, which explain the most amount of variation, all the way up to PC5. And what you can see is that within all of these groups, there is a level of, spect of a spectrum of diversity where you don't have these clear clusters or rather people being pulled out in numerous um, axes of diversity. 
And that is mainly because these samples um, within the United States, these minoritized groups, are admixed and recently admixed. And therefore, you see the sort of large amount of heterogeneity within one group. So you see this diversity. So I'm focusing on Hispanic Latino groups. You know, we typically, when you look at these studies, often they're um, categorized by these different racial ethnic categories uh, in terms of a, a combination of OMB categories usually. Um, and so we're gonna look at just the Hispanic and Latino individuals, and these are all self-identified. So they identify themselves. And I think when we think about genomic research, it's important to us think, what do we actually mean when we say this is a group, right? Is this a group the way we think other groups are groups, right? Is, what do, does it meet assumptions that we would think of in terms of homogeneity? And we can look at the PCs again. And so here you have everybody who identified as being Hispanic, Latino, or Latino. All right, and you see that they sort of run the breadth of diversity across multiple axes. This is just PC1 and PC2. Now, within PAGE, a number of studies did allow people to further identify themselves. Within the Caribbean, people could further identify their ancestry um, as being uh, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or Dominican. Um, and then within the continental US, Mexican, and then for numbers sakes, Central America uh, was combined, and then all of South America was combined. And so when you look at that, you do see some substructure, right? There are differences in terms of where people fall on these different spectrums based on where their ancestry comes from. Right? And these are all people who are sampled within the United States. And so when we say this is a single group, and we do it usually to ensure some level of homogeneity in terms of the distribution of the, the genetics, it's not really met that there's actually any kind of homogeneity within this group if it's so diverse. Another way for us to look at this is admixture. This is an admixture plot. Each line is a person, and they are colored by the proportion of their genome that is assigned to this inferred ancestry component. And so for this run of things, it was five different components. You can see them on the right, the sort of inferred ancestry components of Africa, Europe, the Americas, uh, Oceania, and Asia. And again, this is a very subjective estimate. These are not sort of the truth in terms of what actually existed in history, but rather um, artifacts of the data of who went into the models and what we're seeing. So if you had a different subset of individuals, you'd probably see a little bit different of things um, but sort of what we're looking at for the five components. And so what you see already is that between, you know, even when we think about this, not in terms of multiple PCs, but even just admixture components, you see a wide range of proportions. Uh, on the left-hand side, it's the African-American groups. On average, 80% um, of this European component and 20% of African, which is consistent with other research. And then on the right-hand side with the Spanish Latino individuals, um, you see this wide range of different, of at least three, if not more components. And so if you let people further self-identify, which is the bottom, you see differences, right? So I think it's important to note that if I picked one single person out of this and I saw the proportions, I could not tell you how they self-identify. But there are differences on average that can be informative for how we understand their genetics and what that means for their genetic risk. So sort of an important distinction to know, right? That if a single person you can't really tell based on this data, maybe how they self-identify, but again, we're looking at populations and, and group level dynamics, which they can be informative. Okay, so we've already established that because of history, um, putting it lightly, there are some differences in genetic ancestry um, and the backgrounds of these different groups. And so now we're gonna move on to another relationship. So now, um, you know, we're going to look at a confounding relationship, which means it has to be associated with the exposure, which is the genetics, and also with the outcome, which in this case is BMI. So do we see a relationship between group membership and BMI in the literature? So for this, um, we can rely on um, colleagues' work. We don't have to do it ourselves. There's a wealth of information about this. These are some studies that have been done in the Hispanic Community Health Study and the study of Latinos. Uh, over the past you know, decade, these papers have been published. And what they found is that between these different groups, they see differences in BMI distributions as well as weight gain trajectories. So both in terms of a cross-sectional look at the trait as well as a longitudinal look at the trait, right? And then we also, you know, to, to make it more relevant maybe to health, that there is some differences in the burden of cardiovascular disease risk factors in general between these populations for both men and women. So we can rely on the epidemiological evidence here to really establish this relationship between the group membership and the outcome of interest for this. Okay. So we've done that. We have this all, all these relationships that have been um, shown through different evidence spaces, looking at our work. So now we're gonna say, okay, now does group membership 
um, modify the relationship between these SNPs and BMI, right? How does it do that? And what happens when it's compounded into a polygenic score? So for this, what we did um, is that we applied a published polygenic score for BMI to PAGE. This is the uh, cure it all published in 2019. And it was trained in a European ancestry background sort of groups. Um, and so that's important for, for relevance, but sort of what happens at the performance level between the different groups in terms of ancestry, um, as well as environment. So what we found is that there was a positive relationship on the left-hand side between these um, admixture components. So here it's uh, the inferred immer indigenous population, or immer indigenous uh, ancestry, AME, and the score. And so you have this correlation, positive correlation, where if you have more of this ancestry component, you have a higher score on average. Now, there's really two reasons why this could be, right? We want to find out which one it is. One is that this is a confounder. It needs to be adjusted out. It introduces bias, and therefore it needs to be dealt with. The other option is that this is actually informative for our risk model, right? And we want to know which one it is because you don't want to sort of adjust everything out if it could be informative for your prediction model. Because again, the point of these models is prediction, right? It's prediction of the trait. And so what we can do is look at different models. On the right-hand side, what I'm showing you is the unadjusted score. This is the R squared, incremental R squared. Um, and then you adjust the top three principal components and it goes up. Uh, and that just shows us that this is not a true relationship with the trait. Uh, it is some sort of a confounder that needs to be adjusted for, right? So we want to make sure we adjust for this in the model. But what's interesting is that if you only adjust for this one proportion of ancestry in the model, so be very specific and explicit of what you're adjusting for, the, the accuracy does better, right? So this sort of um, reinforces the notion that when you look at prediction models and you're thinking about what you include versus what you don't include, it's important to think through every one of the terms and think about what you're doing, right? In terms of, are you throwing the baby out with the bathwater with adjusting for everything? Or are some things relevant for your outcome, right? And this is sort of different based on your question. If you wanted to distill things to something independent of PCs, independent of background variation, then maybe you don't care, you lose predictive power. You just want everything to be adjusted out. But if you want better predictive power, you want to keep it in. So. It's important for us to look at. Now, you know, when it comes to polygenic score, it's often a relative risk, right? We're looking at relative risk. So you don't really just look at how well the model fits, but you want to know how people are situated relative to other people. So what I'm showing you here is each dot is a person, and I'm showing you their change in ranking before and after adjustment. So if you're above the dash line, that means after adjustment for ancestry, your rank or your risk was upgraded. And if you are on the right underneath the dash line, that means that after adjustment, your risk was downgraded. And so what you can see is that there's sort of an inflection point, this pivot around the average proportion of the inferred ancestry. Now, sort of two important points from this, this figure that I want um, you to look at. And one is that there is differential bias within a single group based on ancestry, depending on how you adjust or don't adjust for this thing, right? So, that's an important to note. So that those with low of this AME ancestry have their risk underestimated beforehand, and those with high um, ancestry have their risk overestimated for this. The other thing to think about is that often you assume a certain level of homogeneity within your sample. And therefore, when you're modeling to the mean, it, that's okay. You're meeting, it's okay. You don't have a lot of variance. So people maybe on the edges aren't too far from the mean. And so it won't make a difference. When you look at these very heterogeneous groups and you look at the large amount of diversity within a single group, it becomes problematic when you model things just to this one mean, right? Because you can see the tails have a big variation in terms of how much things can matter. Um, and so it's sort of important to note again that, you know, it's sort of inherent in the methods. You can always sort of model things to the mean, you look at populations, but it's not just about mean differences, but variance differences as well when you look at this to think about. And then you can say, all right, John, like, I really don't care about rankings. We only care about people who are at the extremes of things, looking at the different distributions. And what I'm showing you here is, okay, well, we take the top decile of this polygenic score, and we call that high risk. And then we take the bottom decile that's low risk, and everybody in the middle, that's fine. You're normal. We don't really care about where you are at the point. And then you look at before and after adjustment. And what you see is the majority of people, they stay where they were, of course, right? If you have 80% of your distribution in a normal category, it's not going to move around that much but about 5% move up and 5% move down. And if you go to the middle, this sort of recapitulates what we saw in the previous figures, where those that have upgraded risk are in the lowest quintiles of this ancestry component, and those that have downgraded risk are at the highest. So again, you have this sort of relationship between ancestry and how your risk is misestimated in this risk score. 
So, you know, we're going to look now between the group membership. We talked a lot about, you know, what happens with ancestry differences and what that means for the risk score. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is it's stratified further by how people self-identify with these Hispanic Latino groups. And looking at Central American, Cuban, Dominican, Mexican, Puerto Rican, and South American, just unadjusted and adjusted models. And what you can see is that even before and after adjustment, there are differences in how well this polygenic score predicts BMI. All right. And this could be, you know, maybe this is because of different ancestry differences in general. We saw that before with the admixture plus and the PCA. Um, it could also be because of environmental context. So it's important for us to sort of pick it apart and see what's actually going on. Because if we don't know what's going on, we don't know what we should be aiming for, how to improve this, how much can we actually do, and what data we need to include in these models. Okay. So getting a more complete picture. So we've established this relationship now between this group membership and the relationship between the SNP and BMI. And so, whoops, what I'm showing you here again is this, this model performance. So adjusted R squared, and you have it separated out by these different groups. Um, and what's important for us to note here is that there's different performance, but this is an integrated model. So it's the PRS and different populations. And so here, what you see is it, partitioned out for those, the polygenic score adjusted for ancestry and the base model of age, sex, and study. And we can actually realign it to see what portion of the variance is being explained by the base model of age, sex, and study, and then what is being adjusted for um, by the polygenic score itself. And what you see here is that, first of all, that it's not consistent between those two components, between the different groups. This is maybe partly due to the sampling structure of who's involved. It could be due to other dynamics included. That we're going to pick apart a little bit further, um, but it's important to know that you know the the Mexican and Mexican American individuals had the lowest performance of just a base model of age, sex, and study, um, but the Dominican group had the lowest for the polygenic score, and this is consistent with ancestry differences in terms of um, there being um, the largest portion of African ancestry in that group versus others. And so, you know, we want to think about is this just a matter of adjustment, right? Do we want to just put more things in the model? If we see this relationship, do you want to keep on adding more and more into the model, just adjust it out, um, which is a standard practice, I think, for a lot of, of model building is just to add more things in that are relevant. But what happens when we add these, this membership in to the model is that the performance actually drops. We lose predictive ability. We lose information by adjusting out this group membership. Um, and so what I'm showing you here at the sort of top left, these bar charts, is looking at the different quintiles of the polygenic score. And what you can see is that there is an overrepresentation of Puerto Rican individuals at the highest quintiles of risk and an underrepresentation of them um, at the lowest quintiles of risk. So their entire distribution, which you can see at the bottom here, um, is shifted towards the right with a higher genetic risk overall. And so if you standardize and stratify by this and it'll shift everybody out in the same direction, um, again, there's two options for whether this is informative or not. Either it's some sort of bias in terms of confounding, or it's a real relationship with the outcome. And what it is that there's, it's a for this case, it's a real relationship with this one population actually has in this sample a higher BMI on average. Now, it's important to note again that this is not something inherently true for these populations. Um, this is one sample with very particular sampling structure in terms of where um, participants came from. The PAGE study is uh, a, a consortium of consortia, uh, but where uh, it's all over the, the country and um, a large portion of the Puerto individuals were actually sampled from New York City, while a lot of the other groups were not. And so there are differences in terms of where you live and what that means. And so we'll, we'll address that further in, in, a, in a slide a little further, but that's one to note that even when we do these studies and we pick things apart and try to find out these dynamics, it's always important to note that a large part of what goes on is mainly due to your study design, right? Who did you actually sample? You know, we have these large studies, but even with the big data we have, we don't even approximate having full catchment for our population, right? There's still some selection going on. Okay. So it's not a matter of adjustment. You know, this also depends on, you know, when we think about what's going on in terms of, is it genetics? Is it social context? Is it environment? Um, it's important to think about the heritability of the trait, right? So how genetic is it even in the first place? What I'm showing you here is comparing and contrasting BMI and height. On the left-hand side, what we did is said, okay, we're going to see just the trait itself. How much of the variation of the trait is explained by the base model? Again, it's age, sex, and study. And then I'm going to add both principal components, and in this case, it's sort of ethnic identities within Hispanic Latino groups, right? And that's a full model. 
And then I'm going to take out either PCs or these sort of social context of these ethnic labels and see how much information do I lose and explain the variability of the trait. On left hand, what you see is that for BMI, if I remove the social labels, I lose a lot more of the explanatory power of the model. I explain less of the variation than if I remove the PCs, right? Now, this is not the case for height, where if you lose the social labels, you lose some information, but not a ton. And if you move the PCs, you lose a ton of information, right? The model is just not as informative. And what this shows us is that, you know, height is a very heritable trait. Genetics just matters more. And in that case, what you see, is, and of course, social context does not matter as much as the actual genetic architecture of it. While we think about a trait like BMI, which the heritability is half, usually it's estimated, but at least half of what a height is, um, we see that the social labels actually mean a lot more than any kind of continuous diversity with PCs, right? And so it's important for us to know sort of what we think the upper bounds are. I mean, this goes to show basically that this is going to be trait specific. It's going to be population specific. There's no one rule that's going to sort of be um, blanket uh, for every kind of situation that we're looking at. Okay. So, you know, what is being captured by these polygenic scores in the first place? Right, so polygenic scores are often built upon genome-wide association studies, which are essentially millions of correlations. Right, you're looking at millions of correlations across the genome, which will of course pick up biology, but will also pick up a lot of other things that are different between the samples in that study. So, looking at the polygenic score, we want to see okay, what is explaining the variation in the score itself. So, not in the trait, but in the score. What we see is overall, um, you know, BMI explains about 3% of the variation for the trait, which is consistent with what we saw before for the R squared. And ancestry um, explains for this specific ancestry component about 18% of the variation in the polygenic score. Now, if we stratify by people group membership, how people self-identify with the Mexican and Puerto Rican groups here, what you see is that there's difference, right? So BMI explains a little bit less in the Mexican and Mexican American individuals. Um, and a little bit more in the Puerto Rican individuals, but ancestry plays a bigger difference in terms of what is actually explanatory in this. So ancestry doesn't actually make a big difference for this component in the Puerto Rican individuals. This is partly just due to the different genetic backgrounds of these groups, um, but also how that relates to the trait. And then you think, okay, well, you know, we know this from, from this part. Um, we can further stratify by an environmental variable, right? So say, okay, based on environmental context, does it actually also show different things, right? And so what we show here is within the Mexican individuals that whether you've ever smoked or you've never smoked in your lifetime, the proportion of the PGS that is being explained by ancestry and BMI is relatively the same, right? It's relatively consistent. But if you look at the Puerto Rican individuals, those who have smoked, the risk score, the proportion of the variance of the risk score is better explained by ancestry in the ever smokers and the never smokers. And this is not to say that smoking alters your ancestry or anything like that, but it's more to say, okay, something is going on here with substructure, even within these groups, that results in different environmental contexts that could be related to how your risk score is being estimated, what it actually is capturing, and it's important to pick that apart. Because remember, a polygenic score, again, is millions and millions of correlations just being added together, and it doesn't pick up just causal relationships, but anything that came along for the ride for that particular study. So these are the considerations to make when you're comparing your training and testing sets. All right, so we've decided, you know, we've looked at this relationship and we found the group membership to smoking to BMI, that sort of um, possible relationship for, for this. But what about more macro scale things to look at, right? Right now we looked at lifestyle choices at individual level. What about um, social and structural determinants of health? So what are social and structural determinants of health? These are um, loosely categorized by the CDC into these five categories, looking at education, uh, healthcare, your environment in terms of the built environments, your neighborhood and what's around, uh, the people that you interact with, so your social and community context, and then economic stability. And so there's sort of these broad different ranges of, of these more macro scale factors that can influence human health. Um, and so if we think about you know, how that relates to genetics, you know, how much of that is overlap with differences in genetics and how much does it not? So we know, oh, this is going to bother me, the font got messed up, but um, that the estimated ancestry proportions actually differ based on geographic area within a single group. So this is an older study from 23ME looking at, um, for this one, just Hispanic Latino individuals in the 23ME database and this is as of 2015, I believe. 
And what you can see is those who identify as being Hispanic or Latino, um, say in Louisiana, have more African ancestry, which is what you'd probably expect. Um, those who identify as being Hispanic or Latino in Texas have more of this indigenous ancestry. Um, and then you see more of the European ancestry maybe in Kentucky and, and Tennessee. And so you see these differences by, by geography, we have slightly different ancestry compositions, right? So if we're thinking of a confounder, we can think, okay, we see differences in the ancestry. Do we also see differences in these social and structural determinants of health? Now, this is a county structural racism measurement model that was published a few years ago now. Um, and then what it did is it created a composite score, um, mainly looking at um, black and white to health dispar or disparities in, in the social and structural determinants of health. Uh, and this included measures such as housing dissimilarity index, school dissimilarity index, graduation ratios, poverty ratios, um, access to health care, so really across those five domains. And what they found that is that a higher county structural racism um, score was associated with a higher BMI in Black individuals and a lower in white individuals. So you see this different relationship, this interaction between race and how structural racism um, affects their, their health. And this was even after accounting for county income, which actually showed that more money is a lower BMI on average. And so what you have here is a sort of two legs of that relationship where you have both an association between genetic ancestry and um, location, loca geographic location, and then between the social and structural determinants, health and location, right? And so you have this sort of confounding factor with BMI as well. And so, you know, again, we can rely on previous work done in the non-genetic space for this, looking at Hispanic Latino groups for the BMI as an outcome or, or a trait to look at for this. And what they did was they were really interested in immigration, right? So people come um, to this country and for many different reasons at different times, um, and they were interested in the process of acculturation, right? So does acculturation make a difference with how uh, your BMI you know, trajectory is or obesity levels in general? And what they found, there was actually no association between a level of acculturation and obesity within these samples. This is again, um, the Hispanic Community Health Study Institute of Latinos. Instead, what they found out is it's really just how long you're in the country, right? How long you're exposed to the obesogenic environment of the United States, right? So the longer you're in this country, the more of an effect it has on these people with BMI, okay? And this is sort of consistent across different groups with some variability, but really it's a sort of a relationship uh, that's been verified. So we have these social and structural determinants of health that align with these group memberships and geography and the outcome, and it all gets very complicated. So. Um, I was, you know, um, honored to work with uh, Lindsay Fernandez Rhodes, who led this um, this paper here with her postdoc, Kristen McArdle, published in 2021. And what they wanted to do was integrate the polygenic score into this model of immigration and BMI and what's happening. And this is a sort of one of the things we wanted to do was stratify by the group membership and see what's going on. And I'm going to walk you through this. It's kind of a big table. And so. First thing to note is that, you know, as we saw before with our fit, the model fit for this PRS and a lot of other factors is different by different groups. They included way more variables in their models, which is why the R squared is just bigger in general. Um, but we see similar trends in terms of the polygenic score. So you see differences between this. If we look at the main effect of the polygenic score itself by background, um, even after adjustment, we see differences, right? So you see different effect sizes of the polygenic score. They had a number of different models that were built up and successfully bigger and bigger models. Um, but it's important for us to focus on model four in which the interaction term was introduced. And so if we look at model four and look at the interaction term between a polygenic score for BMI and um, age of immigration, and each one of these categories is compared to those who immigrated to the United States uh, over the age of 20, so past the age of 20 as adults. And what you can see, first of all, is that, you know, one thing to note is that, again, it's different by different group. So we see that, for example, within Cuban individuals, those that came to the United States between birth and five years of age, um, compared to those who came over 20 years of age, their polygenic score is actually more informative. It does better, right? It has a more, it has a larger effect size during this interaction term. Um, and so it's more predictive. Now, if we do the exact same comparison of those who were brought to this country as, as small children and compare them to those who came as adults, we see the opposite effect in the South American individuals, right? You see this opposite effect of what's going on. Um, and so what, what's important to note here, and then again, you see it different from the from Mexican individuals that's stratified. And what I really want to hammer home here is not the actual effect estimates themselves, 
but rather that the same environmental variable that you measured can mean very different things in different groups based on their cultural contexts. People come to this country again for different reasons at different times due to different socio-political contexts. And it's important for us when we're expanding our genetic models to include these contexts to better understand them and have some expertise. And so it's not a matter of just plugging more and more data in, but really being thoughtful about what you're putting in and to understand the dynamics at play. Okay. So, you know, in all, it really just gets a bit complicated, right? There's more you can add on to hear about this conceptual framework. The DAG gets a bit unwieldy. Um, but it's not to say that you can't do this, but rather that it's important to think about, right? You can't include all the factors, but you can thoughtfully think about a lot of them. And so, you know, one of the major barriers I think we think about when how we do this is, you know, one of the more foundational things, which is the imprecision when describing our study populations, right? We're very imprecise in general. This is one of the few studies that allowed people to further self-identify beyond the Hispanic Latino label. Often, you know, what you saw with people when they added race is that these people don't actually put race down because it's not applicable to how they self-identify. And so there's a lot of imprecision as to how we capture this in our studies. And one of the things we think about health equity is, you know, how can you have any accountability to assess the equity if you can't measure who people are, right? If you can't describe them. Um, and so how do you know the study populations without allowing them the opportunity to describe themselves to you and give you some context? So this includes a lot of different contexts, including race, ethnicity, ancestry, ge geography, um, other demographics. But I focus on genetics here. So what I'm looking at here is this is the GWAS catalog. And I am not doing this to pick on the GWAS catalog. They did what they had to do, and I understand it. Um, but here's how they define their groups. This is from a 2018 a paper. And you know when they define these different groups to, to have accountability for who is included in genome-wide association studies, they had to combine a number of different constructs. They had to combine genetic ancestry, geography, nationality, and race. And so you see this in some definitions. But here it's for European. Um, where you have people have been described the authors as European, Caucasian, or white, um, or maybe on a national level, Dutch. Uh, and then they also did some computational metrics to, to cluster individuals as well. And so here you have sort of this, this hodgepodge of, of whatever was available to the curators to help create this accountability. And so it's very imprecise, but you know, again, you work with what you have, um, but it would be helpful as a field for us to have a bit more consistent measures of how we describe people. So this was um, tackled somewhat within the NASM report who came out that came out next spring that I was honored to be part of. Uh, it's available online with some pretty cool tools if you want to check it out. But basically uh, de designed some guiding principles with specific recommendations of how we can do better in this space. Um, with you know one thing that was really important for this, I think, is that again, there's no blanket approach. There was no one answer given. It's all about what your question is. Um, you know, what you have access to, and to really be specific in that front, you know, for, for future research as well as your current research. Okay. Now, you know, I want to say there is a cost to granularity, right? It's not just me saying you need more granularity, you need to be more specific, because there's a, there's a heavy cost for what happens. And the cost is the sample size, right? If I keep on cutting my data up into smaller and smaller bits, and to start stratifying by all these different factors, eventually I get to such small sample sizes that I can't actually find anything, right? And so in this day of big data, it's important to know that even though the numbers of participants in these diverse groups is larger, they're still proportionally much smaller than other than the European ancestry populations, um, as well as if you need more granularity, it just gets smaller and smaller. So it's not to say it's sort of a balance here. And, to that extent, you know, it is a trade-off between the power and the precision of your question and your study. Again, I'm an epidemiologist, so we think we teach a lot about population definitions. Um, this is in contrast thing to the way a lot of other fields think about populations in terms of population genetics or, or other sort of fields. But we think about, you know, what is the target population? What is your source population? What is your study population? And again, I want to just hammer home the point that even in this age of big data, where you have millions and millions of people in your studies, we do not even approach the level needed to not have to worry about representativeness or bias, right, in terms of selection bias. You still have to think about who's in your study, why they're in the study, you know, when was your study, things like that. And for this, you need to have precision in your question, right, especially when you look at polygenic scores, 
you're no longer looking for discovery of, of specific loci, but rather what's happening across an entire population. So important to think about this, this trade-off between power and precision when thinking about your questions. Okay. So what does this all mean? Right? What do we do looking forward for this? Um, and so, you know, one thing that I think I, I will always sort of harp on, um, which is sort of hindered by the, the practicalities of it, is that it does seem a bit ridiculous that we pool people from across two different continents and very diverse histories into one group and say they're the same, they're one group, they're homogenous. It seems a, a bit ridiculous, both in terms of just it sounds silly on its face, but also scientifically it's not very valid, right? The other thing I want to talk about is that admixed individuals and groups are not just a sum of their parts. Often in method development space, we think about, okay, well maybe, you know, if we wanna look at the risk in admixed groups, all we need to do is say, okay, we're gonna model them as sort of this, this um, a summation of all their bits and parts, look at these different haplotype tracks and then sum them together and that's the same. It'll be a valid estimate. And the, the truth of the matter is like, that's part of it, but also there are communities and populations on their own, the different dynamics that need to be appropriately modeled. The other thing is that you know the development of these risk models is complex. It requires expertise for the populations at hand. It requires expertise for the outcomes, for the environmental contexts. And this does require a very cross-disciplinary approach. We can't all do it all, right? There's just no way, especially in academic science, we've all specialized such a degree that when you want to do these integrated models, you really need to reach across the aisle to different fields to get the best work together. And so, you know, as we move for this genetic risk models, these integrated models of precision health, and hopefully to sort of ex, um, target some health inequities, uh, it's important to have that cross-disciplinary approach. Okay, so what do we need again? You know, often we think about very simplistic sort of models of if genetics, then outcome. Um, and we're used to thinking of that really micro, micro scale for genetic space. But it's important to know that there are models for how to look at the full system, right? So this is an older model from about 2006, it's been adapted here in this slide, where you see that, you know, it's a socio-behavioral biology nexus in this multidimensional space, very long name for basically saying everything is connected. It's you know, everything everywhere all at once, but that you have these sort of nested hierarchies, right? Where you have the genomic substrate at the bottom, it goes more macro, macro and scale within the body. And then once you get to the stream level here in time, you go above, it's above the individual level, right? You're looking at the micro level, meso level, macro level, and then global level. And it's gonna be an increasing challenge for us moving forward, having to reconcile these two levels and how they are modeled, right? Because below, we often think about genetic similarity when it comes to the genetics and genomics, right? Looking at how similar people are to each other, but then above the water sort of line, you have it more as a social construct. Right, so you're thinking about these things maybe more the long lines, in the United States at least, of racial and ethnic groups and how that works with social contexts. So how we reconcile that will be sort of a large open question in the next few years as we're bringing these big data initiatives together and try to reconcile these different streams of data. You know, again, it's really important for us to note that there are models. This is an adapted socio-ecological model looking at things um, from the micro scale genetics and genomics up to individual level, interpersonal relationships, neighborhood levels and societal relationships. And again, this is sort of becoming increasingly important as we move from the sort of era of GWAS in which individual loci are, the point is discovery and trait mapping to characterizing population level distributions for genetic risk. Right, So you're moving away from biology and mechanism and more towards what happens overall. And at this case, you need to have a more macro scale of what's going on with your populations, especially as many of the works that, that we, do, we do now are not limited to a certain geographic area or context, or rather sort of whatever we can pull together to get bigger numbers. But understanding what's happening at these different scales can help us um, pose better questions and do better studies. So, Again, you know, I think this is a this is an epidemiologist sort of lament here where it's that big data is necessary for what we do, but it's not sufficient, right? It's a necessary cause of, of discovery and, and what we're doing, but not sufficient in that it's not enough. You know, we have a sort of unprecedented statistical power to look at things, um, but it's important to know that if you pull everyone together and you just sort of average everything out, you can actually obscure meaningful substructure, what's going on, that can be really interesting. Um, and I think especially when we think about health disparities, it's important to define the lens in which you're sort of framing the question, right? Because depending on how you look at the data from what angle it is, you might have 
different answers. And it's largely because you've asked different fundamental questions. And so having that precision is sort of important for us uh, moving forward. Okay. So, you know, again, I wanted to sort of uh, kind of back up this high level. And I think this is what I spent a lot of time in my work trying to do, which is that when we model human health, uh, many of us are very computational and we make a large number of assumptions. But I think assumptions in our models is different than what we accept as the default, right? Often genetics, we have whatever is there to do the first thing, and then we sort of try to um, fill in the gaps afterwards. And it's largely due to these, these biases and what we accept as the default in the questions we ask, who we include in our research, both in terms of participants and the workforce, um, and which systems we even choose to model. Right. And you see this in terms of a large number of outcomes that might be overrepresented in some minoritized groups, but are understudied at a national level. You see this in terms of when you make the first genotyping arrays and you use them, they're mostly for European ancestry backbones, right? And that was sort of the way it was for years. In terms of you know what who we even include for these biobanks, right? Where the big biobanks are, what populations they draw from. Um, and what do these convenient samples look like? It sort of has this default baked into it. So again, if we think about equity, I think it's not enough to sort of go with the default and then, you know, try to backfill things later on. You know, trickle down theory doesn't work for many things that includes research, right? It doesn't really work. And so we need to think about what the default is and challenge those systems. Now, I also wanted to point out for the workforce diversity. So this is the GWAS catalog. Um, as I said before, our genetic studies, the participants are not representative of the global population here. It's not representative of the US population at all, but it is sadly representative of us. Uh, it looks like our demographics. And I know that I didn't go into this for selfish reasons, for all well, it's purely selfish reasons. And then I'm sure other, other people didn't as well. And so it's important for us to think about what systems are in place that produce this and how can we change them? I think unless we sort of go back to the default and the systems at place, we're just going to keep on doing the same thing and the same thing over and over again. Um, and I think we, if we want to achieve these goals of sort of um, figuring out what's going on with health disparities and providing solutions for health equity, we need to fix the solutions um, in our own yard as well. And so again, so the last question I'm going to leave you with is as we move towards precision health, it's important to know precise for who. You know, I would spend a lot of time at different institutions that have different focuses on public health versus precision health and precision medicine. Um, and it's important to think about, you know, as we have this revolution and we move at, you know, light speed to make these developments, who we're leaving behind uh, and is it acceptable for us, right? And that includes both in terms of technology as well as the methods that we develop. And I wouldn't be here without um, my uh, collaborators. The page has been a lovely home for me to do a lot of work over the last almost 10 years. Um, the Lindsay Fernandez Rhodes led the lovely um, acculturation immigration story, and she's at Penn State. And then my lab, um, which has been very helpful and, and uh, a joy to, to be with. So thank you. I'm happy to take any questions in person or online. So that was a great talk. Thank you so much. And please, those in the audience here, um, come to the mic with questions as well as those online. Uh, to send in your questions. Um, so I'm going to start with a question, and it's really in the context of all your work, um, Jen, and then your work on the, the study, the, the consensus study, mm -hmm. and the concept of genetic similarity. Mm -hmm. If you were talking to a junior researcher who was starting out their career, they yeah. read the consensus study report, they're trying to make some decisions and, and understanding how they think about different approaches mm -hmm. related to their work and their work has a context around health disparities. Yeah. What, what, what advice would you give that person? Yeah, it's a hard one for health disparities. So I think one thing that we just need to do better as a field, and I think this is actually, the report has been adopted, I think much more readily by more junior folks who are learning and trying to do better actively. Um, it's really about what your question is anchored in. And so if your question is anchored in the access, you know, what does this, is this genetic test relevant for all of the genetic diversity that's present that we need to do that, then maybe, you know, when you think about the descriptors, it's not really about disparities in terms of racial context, but really the representation of the panels and the, the sequences that go into that to find these panels and, and to find these, these tests. But if you're looking at a specific disparity 
that is quantified on these sort of bounds of social constructs and race, ethnicity, then I think it's it behooves you to sort of think, first of all, do we think there's actually a role for genetics in this? And how do you thoughtfully align how you look at this with the question you have at hand? And that includes maybe only including individuals that are relevant to that um, group. And then if you're going to do along racial or ethnic lines, make sure your samples are actually those racial ethnic groups, not some sort of amalgamation of genetic ancestry groups that sort of recapitulate these sort of labels, but are actually fundamentally different in terms of how they're categorized. Um, which is basically just to say that it really depends on your question and making sure you're very thorough that, okay, the question that I'm asking, do I really need to look at race or ethnicity, social context? Do I really need to look at genetics at all? And how do I make sure that they're aligned with each other in a way that is meaningful and not just using whatever's there? Yeah, if you can. But I mean, it's hard if you're junior, but whatever you can do. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Our first question. Very cool talk. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have two extremely related questions. I think I missed early on yeah. in the page project. Yeah. What are the like sample sizes you're working with? Yeah, yeah. Project? Sorry about that. Yeah. I'm a bad epidemiologist here. <clears throat> I scold my students. It was uh, 50,000 individuals, about 22,000 of individuals self identified as Hispanic Latino, about 18,000 as African American, and then smaller groups of Asian, um, Native American, and Native Hawaiian. Okay. Because I was curious, there was some slides where there was some unadjusted and adjusted, mm -hmm. adjusted R squared comparisons. Yeah. And I was wondering what like the statistical resolution of those, of those, uh, you know, um, bars were on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so um, for some of them, they do overlap in terms of their uh, resolution. For the effect sizes, they did overlap. So for the R squared, though, because it's still large enough sample size, the R squared is pretty tight in terms of the comp intervals there. And so those are actually different in terms of the performance. Um, but it is hard to sort of see, you know, there's not really a, a, a easy way to estimate these sort of measures to see how different they are. But at least for like the correlations and everything, they were all, so with numbers in the in the tens of thousands that you have enough to see that they're different. Yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? Online? So this question that we have asks you to return to your discussion of PRS changes in immigration status. Uh -huh. And it reads, it is not clear why PRS changes with immigration status. We do not expect SNPs to change in such short periods of time. Yeah. So can you elaborate? Yeah, yeah. So the way I interpret it is not that the biology changes. The mechanism doesn't change. What does change is how much the biology is allowed to matter, right, with the environment. So heritability is not a static measure. It is about a balance of environment and um, genetics. And when you change the context, you change that balance between what matters for genetics and what matters for environment. And so for immigration status, what you're saying is that, you know, when you, in certain groups, um, genetics can matter more because all the environment, maybe the environmental is, is that side of things is um, more consistent across individuals and therefore there's less variability. Therefore genetics explains more of the variability. It could be sort of the other way around. So I don't really think of it in terms of the biology changing, but rather how much of the, of the variance in the outcome can we actually explain with genetics versus environment? Um, but I agree, I wouldn't expect the biology to change for the, that part. Hey, Jen, that was great um, and very thought provocative. So my question is, um, in the page study, do you get the sense that if you had enough of the social, cultural, environmental information that you wouldn't need the race information at all? Is it possible to essentially collect enough social, cultural information that these other sort of more distant proxies just don't really matter? Yes and no. So I think when we think about a lot of, you know, when we think about racial categories, often we're bringing things down to sort of white versus black, right, in terms of that. Now, when we think about race in terms of the OMB categories, often they sort of conflate this sort of based on physical characteristics, social construct with sort of national origin as well. And so one of the other groups I didn't talk about in this group, which is sort of a, um, you know, other side of the same coin in terms of the Spanish Latino groups is that you have the Asian group here. And Asian, again, it's about, you know, it's a large geographic area you're covering here. It's about two, over half of the global population in one group. 
And so it's not that if you had all the social and structural determinants of health, you could get rid of it, but you could focus it, I think, away from these maybe racial, broad stroke racial categories, and maybe focus on what, how that aligns with more granularity in terms of geography, what people are exposed to. And that might um, be against the along the lines of different immigrant groups or different communities in the United States that maybe along, you know, even within a certain geographic area for the, for the, the resolution that we have this data, even within that sort of granularity, you still would have substructure based on these different groups you need that information for. And so it's sort of a, um, it's sort of a, and a strong answer, but yes, yes and no, sort of it depends on, yeah. Go ahead. We'll take another question from online. This is on social and structural determinants. Yes. And it reads, for BMI, the emphasis in this talk seems on ancestry and heritability. Ancestry could be a surrogate for number of social determinants, as you discussed, including the environmental exposures. Did you replicate your finding using independent data sets? Yes. So one of the things we did was that the, the PAVE study is um, four different studies combined. It is the Hispanic Community Health Study, it is the Women's Health Initiative, it is the Multi-Ethnic Cohort, and it is the Biome Biobank. So these are all different studies in terms of the times that they were collected, the way people were recruited, um, and sort of what populations they, they draw from. And these dynamics were consistent across all the different studies. I didn't have time to show you in depth. But there is consistency between this, and we're in the process right now of uh, replicating it um, with uh, with all of us for some of the data that's available. But not all the data that we need is available right now for all of us. But we're trying. So I have a, an additional question. Yeah. And you showed two different models of frameworks with regards to how bringing different social contexts. Yeah. And um, how do you bring diverse um, expertise, disciplinary expertise, in the research? and to, yeah. to ask the questions and interpret the data. I think it's down to the money. It all comes down to money, right? I mean, I think, you know, we like to think that in science, we're about the truth and everything, but it is, it's capitalism like everything else. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it is very difficult to get sustainable funding across different disciplinary sciences in a way that is not exploitative. Um, when it comes to geneticists reaching out to ethicists or sociologists, and they, can you just give me some, you know, to put your name on this grant and I'll, you know, provide a little bit of your salary and I'll never listen to you. Or, you know, to have it sort of be equal from the get-go, it's sort of very hard to find these. And I, and I don't know of any really good routes to do this because you want to have people coming into the room with equal standing and equal respect. And that is very difficult to do. Um, given the current funding mechanisms and the current economy of academic researchers. Um, and so having sort of a, a better and better publicized and better rewarded um, avenues for that research would be, be great. You know, it's not, it's not just about the money coming from the NIH or other institutions, but also that your institutions themselves reward you for promotion, right? You're always thinking about that. Um, and so it's the whole sort of economic system rewarding that in a way that I think right now it's very difficult to do. Yeah. So with that, I can say thank you so much for thank such you. a great Thank you for talk. having me. Thank you everyone for attending in person and online today. Thank you.